our last time we're going to be able to spend time together this particular uh, occasion and it's just been a pleasure to be able to be here on behalf of Gail and I we thank all of you for your hospitality and for inviting me back um, and I enjoy coming you know if you find somebody that's better why well, just feel free I'll be glad to, 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 to decline my position, but I would, and I'm very happy to be able to come at any time. Tonight we're going to continue on in a series that we had last year here called Bible Grace. It's kind of one of those unending series that never ends. Because the Bible is full of individuals who stand out for one particular thing or another. Now just because I call it the Bible Grace does not mean that the person is great because I'm simply referring to this individual as being an example either for good or bad. And so he just, it, it just is somebody that uh, I think we need to recognize and the principle that they teach or the principle that they leave us needs to be understood. We're gonna to talk to you tonight about an individual that you've probably never heard of. I know I'm looking at Bible students. I know I'm looking at a lot of people who've read their Bibles maybe several times, but I doubt that you've ever heard of this fellow. If you did, you're very unusual. We're going to be talking about a subject that hardly ever gets any recognition, hardly ever gets any mention. I mean, we mentioned it in our sermons in passing, but as far as an in-depth study on the subject, I don't know that I've ever done that in the last 50 years that I've been preaching. It's a subject of great importance, though, and I think that you will recognize it once we, once we uh, get into it. But this individual that I'd like to introduce to you tonight is a guru. Have you ever heard of him? A guru. He is recorded in the Bible and he stands out for something that is worthy of our attention. Here's what it is. Proverbs 30, 1 through 3. The words of a guru, the son of Jacob, his utterance. This man declared to his heel, to his heel, and he called, surely I am more stupid than any man. That's, that's, the, that's the sermon tonight. Not that we're going to talk about stupidity, but we're going to talk about wisdom. He is the opposite of what we ought to be. And wisdom is a subject that hardly gets any recognition at all. You know, but as we go through here, I want you to be impressed with the idea how much the Bible actually says about wisdom and the obtaining of wisdom and the practice of wisdom. It's amazing, and I, I think that you all recognize this, especially those of you who study and, and present sermons. When you take a word and you begin to study it, you, think, you begin to realize, well, I didn't know that was in the Bible. I didn't know it said this about that and so forth and so on. It just, it's amazing how much the Bible says about everything, but we never really recognize because we do, don't do any in-depth study on it. This man was the stupidest man he felt like that had been he says, I do not have the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom nor have knowledge of the Holy One. That's a terrible thing, not to have any knowledge of the Holy One. Now, I want to suggest to you tonight that wisdom is not knowledge. Knowledge is the accumulation of information. It's the accumulation of all the things that you read and you get knowledge, maybe in a particular area. It could be history. It could be, you know, science. It could be religion. And you have a lot of knowledge, but I know a lot of knowledgeable people that don't have much wisdom. It, it's not understanding either because people can get knowledge and they can understand it and so forth, but they don't have the wisdom enough to carry it out. So wisdom kind of stands on its own. And uh, again, as I said, we're going to talk about this because if we live in a world today where common sense is completely gone. I mean, you, you know, you think about this, you think about the things that our world is facing you know, the area of, uh, you know, same-sex marriage and the woke thing, you know, and, and, uh, and, and all that stuff. Whenever you, you, you hear that, you just have to sit back and think, how did our world ever get to this point? How did our people ever get to this point? They're not using a whole lot of wisdom here whenever they make statements that they make and try to, to produce uh, ideas and doctrines that just don't make sense at all. And wisdom, the lack of it, is one of the things that has brought all of that on. Now, when we're talking about wisdom, there's an opposite to this man. A guru said, I am more stupid than any man. But here's a man that could say, I am more wise than any man. And yet, with this man, Solomon, he is known as the wisest man that ever lived. And yet, even with his wisdom, he made a lot of mistakes. 
at least towards the end of his life. He allowed strange women, the Bible says, to lead him away from his God. He made, he made many mistakes, of course, but, uh, you know, even, even with all of that, I suppose that we can still say he is the wisest man that ever lived because he had a wisdom that was given to him of God. You remember when all that took place in 1 Kings, the fourth chapter? Solomon had taken over his father's position as being king, but Solomon was a, a young man, and he didn't know exactly how to be king. And so God approached him and he said, if you ask anything, I will give it unto you. So Solomon could have asked for wealth. He could have asked for, you know, the hands of his enemies in battle. He could have asked for prestige. He could have asked for just anything because God says, whatever you ask, I will give it to you. You know what he asked? He says, give me wisdom that I may know how to go out and come in. You'd think he'd know how to come out and go in, wouldn't you? You'd think he'd know when to get in out of the rain. As we say, some people don't even have the wisdom to get out of the rain. And he seemed to be, as a young person, of that particular nature. Just give me wisdom that I might know how to go out and come in. Give me wisdom that I might be able to guide such a great people that you're putting me over here. As David, of course, had built the kingdom up, but Solomon now taking it over, he didn't know what to do. And so he's asking for that wisdom. You know what God did? God gave him wisdom that excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt. Down in 1 Kings 4, 34, and there came of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon for all kings of the earth which heard of his wisdom. His wisdom is demonstrated several times through the Bible of how to deal with situations and deal with problems. It was because of his wisdom that he was able to accomplish a great deal. Solomon was the one that was given the task to build the great temple of God. And he certainly used his wisdom there. How that, you know, I just, it's, it's unbelievable how they built that temple. You know, some of the stones in that temple, in the foundation, are as big as this building. They cut them out and hewn them out out in the quarry and they hauled them in somehow and they set them in place and they all fit together because there was not to be a, a, a sound of a hammer and chisel on the temple spot. It had to fit perfectly when they brought it together. And you think about, you know, all of the, 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 the means by which Solomon had to go about to obtain the timbers and to obtain workers and all of that. He, he was a very, very wise man, the wisest man. I guess you could say that ever lived, save Jesus Christ. Now, in association with this sermon, there is another sermon that I've tied in with this, and I've called it, Don't Be a Darwin Award Winner. I'm not talking about Darwin, if, you, if, if any of your first names are Darwin. I'm not talking about Darwin McGinnis here or any of those individuals. I'm talking about Charles Darwin. You know the fellow who messed up things a long time ago in the educational process because he came up with this idea that evolution was the way that man came about. And through evolution, everything has evolved and, and that there is no God in this process. It just, you know, I, I don't know what he started with. You'd have to start with something and that has to come from somewhere. And so there has to be a beginning somewhere, but I guess they refuse to acknowledge that. One of the, you know, you've seen this, this, this uh, I'm sure it's kind of a graph and it shows, you know, a little fish here, and then it gets to, to be a different uh, shape and form and so forth. And then it gets the, uh, up, comes up out of the water, and it keeps getting bigger, and finally it turns into an ape, and finally it turns into a man. You've seen that, that, that thing, and it's in a lot of books. I never could figure out how they got the woman out of that. <laughs> they never tell you that. There's not a woman in there. I mean, there, it's just, it, you know, it comes up and he, he, he becomes a man through evolution. So how did the woman evolve is what I'd like to know. But they don't tell you how that happened. But I can tell you where, the, where you can learn it. I, in, in the Bible, God created man and he put man asleep and he took from man a bone and he made woman. Now that makes sense. But to think that a woman, you know, just automatically appears because man's come from a, an amoeba in the ocean that doesn't make any sense at all. So Darwin is considered as being very foolish by the science, by, by, by the, the Christian world, I guess. He is, you know, we think he didn't have much wisdom whenever he did this. And so they have started what is called a Darwin Award. And it, got, it comes out every year. 
and there's a bunch of them. And if you really want, you know, it's kind of sad for me to say if you want to, you know, have some good reading to read about the misfortune of people. But if, if you want to do this, please do this because I, I want you to realize that I'm not making this up. But get online, go to Google, and just search it, and just ask for the Darwin Awards, and you'll have a good reading tonight. The Darwin Awards are, uh, it, it, I'm, I'll get to them in a little bit, but the book of Proverbs has much to say, and we have Proverbs 1 here as our reading. Right from the very beginning, the book of Proverbs, which was written by Solomon, the wisest man, he says, Wisdom crieth with eyes. She uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief place of concourse, in the openings of the gates. In the city she uttereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn ye out at my reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make my, known my words unto you. So he, he starts off the very book itself of, uh, of what we call, maybe called the book of wisdom, the book of Proverbs, uh, with this idea that uh, wisdom needs to, to enter into our lives. So let's just look at these Darwin Awards for a minute. There's a couple of them that stand out. I mean, I, I just, when I was searching this, I found so many didn't know which ones to choose. But they are given each year to people who make really, really bad decisions. Okay? Bad decisions. Just like Darwin made a bad decision whenever he came up with that idea of, uh, of evolution. Here are some examples. Fabio was one of those men. He was from Italy, and he came from a farm where they raised uh, emus. And, uh, and, and he didn't want to be a farmer, and so he struck out on his own, and he became a truck driver. That's a long way from a me, from a farmer, but he wanted to be a truck driver, and he became a very good truck driver. But Fabio was so fascinated with gadgets. Now I like gadgets. You know, you, you get the, once you buy a gadget, you begin to get these magazines that has all these gadgets in it. For instance, you know there'll be an ink pen that has a camera on it, and secretly you can take people's picture. <laughs> There'll be an ink pen that has a microphone on it, and if you want to record somebody's message and they don't even know you're recording it, you got this little microphone here. Uh, there's, there's, there's earphones that you can hear somebody whispering in the next county. <coughs> they make that claim, not the next county, but they make the claim that you can hear somebody whispering in, in, in the corner of the room. That's a, that's a fascinating gadget. Now, I bought a lot of those gadgets because they make them sound real good, but they don't work a whole lot of times. And so, and so this man, Fabio, he was fascinated by gadgets and he got him a pen that was a 22 pistol. You know, think about that, a 22 pistol, a little thing like that. And he was in a bar one night and he was telling the people there at the bar, he says, he says, I got a pen that's a pistol. And they said, you're lying. Nobody can make a pistol that small. He said, yeah, here, I'll show you. And he clicked it. Fabio was 28 years old. <laughs> Wisdom. I mean, how, how, <laughs> how stupid could you be to point a gun at your head and push the little trigger here? But that's what happens. I've done things. You know, we all have, haven't we? I've got a, I've got a, a, a finger here that the, t the, the, the nail just keeps coming off and keeps falling on because I smashed it one day. And I was trying to put a hitch on a ball, you know, on the back of a truck, and it didn't go down, so I thought, well, I'll just reach up in there. <laughs> and I knew better. Everybody knows better, but I'll just reach up in there and see why that little trigger in there is not flapping big enough for that ball. And when it got up in there, that thing came down. It smashed my finger. I had to go to bed. I was so sick stupidity. We're wiser than that. But we don't use wisdom. We don't think things through enough, I suppose, to see what's going to happen. There's another fellow. He's probably, he, he may even live fairly close to you. His name is Alfred. He was 63 years old. He lives in Brushy Fort, West Virginia. I don't know where that's at. It might just be across the line over here. But I picture Brushy Fort, you know, as being up one of them haulers like y'all live in. And this man had a house that had termites. He had a big termite problem. He heard that gas, propane gas, 
would kill the termites. <laughs> so, so he goes in and he closes all of his windows in his house and he closes the door and he turns on the gas stove and doesn't light it. He just turns it on. And he and his wife go out in the backyard and they, they get in the camper, the old camper that's been there for a while, you know, stuck in the mud. And they get in the camper and they spend the night in the camper while the gas is just filling up that house. He was told that it would kill termites. He get up the next morning, he walked over to the house and opened the door and flicked on the switch. <laughs> Alfred was 63 years old. I wish you'd laugh at things like that. But you know, how, how stupid can you be? We know what gas will do. We know when you fill a room or a container with propane gas and you light it, you know what's going to happen. It threw him clear in the creek, you know, several feet away from the house. It shattered windows, they said, in the town five miles away because of that explosion. He got rid of the termites. <laughs> got rid of the termites. Wisdom. We have to think about what we're doing before we do it. A lot of times we don't do that. We just, you know, jump in and, and we, we just engage in this and not realize what the outcome of it will be. And that's why wisdom is a necessary thing. These fellows had not taken the advantage of God's promise. Did you know that wisdom is something that comes from God? Here's what the Bible says. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given you. James 1 verse 5. Did you know that was in there? How many times have you prayed for wisdom? We pray for a lot of things, but I don't hardly ever hear people praying for wisdom, how to, to, to understand his word, how to apply his word, and how to live perhaps in a, in a very wise capacity. What is wisdom? So we need to define this word tonight. In order to do that, sometimes you have to look at what it's not, because some people have a misconception of what wisdom is. First of all, wisdom is not wealth. We look at a person who has, you know, a big fancy home, you know, kind of like a mansion, and he's got uh, five or six cars and boats and motorcycles and campers and all kinds of things. And, 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 and he, you know, we, we think, boy, and now there's a wise man because they have built up and he's put his knowledge to use and, and he, he, he's, he's worked with his money or whatever and has, has built it up to the extent that, that he's a wealthy man. But wealth is not wisdom. I know a lot of wealthy people that don't have a lick of sense. <laughs> Wisdom is not intelligence. You know, you can go to a doctor, a doctor's office, and, and you know, you'll see on the wall there all the certificates that he has gotten from this medical school and that medical school and all the degrees that they have and so forth. And you think, boy, here's a really wise man. And yet he may not even know how to change a tire in a car. I work for a doctor back home. I had to go change his lights in, the, in, in his office because he really didn't know how to change the lights. He was an educated and intelligent man, you see. So, you know, it, it is not intelligence. It is not age. Sometimes we think, well, somebody who is old, they're experienced. They've been tested and tried and they have done a lot of things and so they got to be wise. No, I know a lot of old people that are not very wise and they continue in their foolish ways many times. And so this is not what wisdom is. It's not wealth, it's not intelligence, it's not age because we all know people who are intelligent, wealthy, and old and still make poor decisions. There are two basic definitions of wisdom. Number one is, and this is perhaps the best one, the ability to discern what is true and right and lasting and to act accordingly. To determine, to know what is true and right and lasting and act accordingly to what you have learned. The second definition is just the opposite of foolishness. So that's a pretty simple definition. It doesn't tell you a whole lot. So. There are two kinds of wisdom. There's a worldly wisdom and there's a godly wisdom. Romans 12, 16 says, Be of the same mind one to another. Mind not high things, but condescend among two men of low estate. Be not wise 
in your own conceits. This is the worldly wisdom. When we are wise in our own way of thinking and the things that we, you know, think that we know and so forth, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we're wise in the things of God. Let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seemeth to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Corinthians, you remember he said that, that, that preaching uh, is, is foolishness to them that don't believe. It's foolishness. And, and, and that is a, you know, it's, it's a worldly foolishness. But, but you know, we have to, to be not unwise, but we have to understand what the will of the Lord is. So we, what we are looking at here tonight is godly wisdom and not worldly wisdom. How do I become wise? Again, the Bible is very plain about this, about how wisdom is developed. Of course, you have to have information, you have to have education, you have to have some knowledge and so forth. And then you take that and, and what you do with it, of course, will make you wise in the things of God. I think one of the first things that makes us wise is we have to understand its value of how important it is. Because we seek after whatever we think is important, we seek after if there's if, if it's if it's money or whatever, or people will put every effort into it. Uh, if it's prestige or power, you know, the political world, they do just about anything to become political and powerful in that position. So we have to realize how important this is. In Proverbs 3, 13 through 16, he said, Happy is the man who finds wisdom, and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. That puts it up there pretty high in things that you want to obtain. He said it is far better than any silver and any gold. You can have a great savings account. You can have a large beautiful home. You can have a superb education. You can have a great job. But if you continually make foolish choices, you will be unhappy. And there is no happiness that will ever come to you. God clearly tells us that wisdom is the greatest value. And once we learn that and accept that, we will be able to acquire the wisdom which is of God. All right, number two. This is the one that sometimes... Uh, I would get in trouble with, I suppose, with some people, because there have been people in the church, I don't know too much about the church here, but, uh, you know, in all my travels and so forth, there are some people that were my age when we were growing up, and uh, they've left the church. They left it because they believed that the church dwelt too much on the fear of God. You know, they're, you know, people, they just left because they, they, they felt like that they were being bound by fear and that they were being led and made to serve God because of fear. And they tell me that all we need to do is preach love and mercy and kindness and forget the fear element. Well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Proverbs 9 and 10, fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. When you fear the Lord for what he is and for who he is, not because you're, you're, you're cowering down and under him, rather, but you fear perhaps maybe the consequences of disobeying him, that's the beginning of wisdom. And, and you can't change this statement right here. It is the beginning of wisdom. So I think fear is very much a part of, of, of our uh, you know, relationship with God. There was a man by the name of Haider Siddiqui who was a cab driver out in Los Angeles, California. He had picked up a fellow, and the guy wanted to go to the airport because he was flying back to New York City. So he takes the fellow, this is his job, he takes the fellow to the airport in Los Angeles, he drops him off, and then he goes on another pickup and so forth and, and, and gets someone else and goes somewhere else. Well, in the meantime, he realizes that the man he had taken to the airport had left his briefcase in the car. And so when lunchtime came, he met up with another cab driver and they thought, well, let's just look inside, see what's inside. Now he's a cab driver. He, he, you know, he doesn't have a whole lot of money. He just lives from paycheck to paycheck and, and doesn't make a whole lot. He's got a, a wife and some kids and the kids, you know, are sick and all this. He could certainly use some money, but they look in this uh, attache case and, and uh, it's filled with diamonds. 
Now, they didn't know if they were legal or illegal. But in this attaché case was the name of a man, the man who had taken the cab ride, and a phone number. And so he calls, gets a hold of this fellow, and he says, I have this briefcase that you left in my car. Oh, the man was so happy. You imagine he would be to have all of them jewels and so forth and to lose them. There's a lot of money involved here. But you know, Mr. Siddiqui, he was, uh, he was smart enough to say, well, I'll meet you at the police station and we'll make the exchange. I want to make sure it's your suitcase and we want to make sure it's on the up and up, you know, and all that. So they made the arrangement. The man was satisfied with that. They met at the police station. Sure enough, it was his diamonds. He had legally purchased them. They weren't stolen, you know, or anything like that. He just went out there and bought these diamonds and he's taken them back to New York City to sell them and so forth. So everything was on the up and up. And, and, and so the attache case was handed over to him. And of course, the man wanted to give Mr. Siddiqui a reward for his honesty. But he asked him a question. He said, sir, he said, you had these in your possession. And he said, you could have kept them. You could have sold them. You could have ended up with a lot of money. He said, why did you call me? And why did you turn this back over to me? And not a diamond was missing in there. Why did you do that? Here's what Mr. Siddiqui says. He said in his broken accent, God is up there. That's what he said. God is up there. He always watches. That's the fear of wisdom. You see that, that he was he, he had done something very wise right there because he realized God is always watching. God is always up there. And, and that's the fear that I'm talking about. I'm not talking about a fear where you, you know, you just tremble underneath of the thought of God. But he had the right fear of God that made him make the right choice. We don't live in the fear of God in the sense that he's going to strike us down whenever we do something that is wrong. And, and that he's just setting up in heaven, just waiting up for us to mess up. That's not the God we have. But we need to fear God when we are dishonest. We need to fear God whenever we don't do what is right because there will be consequences. And that's what's wrong with our society today. The fear of man has been taken out of man. That's why it's, you know teachers in school can have no control over their students because they don't fear. They realize the, the teacher can't do anything anymore. You can't correct the child. You can't, you, 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 you know, you can't touch the child and so forth. I'll tell you what, our teachers, when I went to school, they drove that fear out of us or put the fear in us, I guess maybe is what I should say. You know, the, the, the paddle was used quite frequently in my class. And that put the fear in you. I tell you what, one time we acted up, a bunch of us boys did. And Mrs. Jury, she is a wonderful teacher. I still love her. She made us line up and we put our hand out like that. And she took that little 12 inch ruler and she went to hitting the top of our hand. That hurts more than a, more than a stick. I mean, hitting the top of the hand with that, I'll guarantee you we never did that again. <laughs> because you knew if you did it again, it was going to happen again. The fear is the beginning of wisdom. You get smart whenever you are afraid of the consequences of what's going to come. People need to have a little more wisdom when it comes to eternal life. We need to have a little more fear of losing our soul and meeting the consequences of eternal hell. It is in the sense that we have the greatest respect for him. That's what that fear is, for what he expects of us. I have the greatest respect for my father. And I think uh, almost all of us now at this point do. We had a respect for our father because they corrected us when we needed corrected. And, and as I said, it is the beginning of wisdom. We learn not to do that again. We learn what we need to do and what we're supposed to do. Fear is the beginning of wisdom. Seek good advice. Whenever you, are, you don't know exactly what to do, we need to look out for those who have greater wisdom than we do, and we need to seek that. In Proverbs 12 and 15, fools think they need no advice, but the wise listen to others. Isn't that simple? The wise listen to other people. We listen to our moms and our dads. We listen to the church leaders. We listen to people who have at least some aspect of wisdom in their lives. And, and, and that's what we need to do. We need to seek out that wisdom. Now, I've heard this expression many times, but it actually came from Mark Twain. Mark Twain was quite a writer and quite a speaker. 
He said, when I was a teenager, I thought my dad wasn't very smart. When I was 18, I thought he was the dumbest person on earth. I think it probably starts about 13 or 14, though, and goes on up to about 18. And he said, whenever I got to be 30, I thought he wasn't quite as dumb as I thought. And when I was 40, I thought he was the smartest man I ever met. Isn't it amazing how our dads change? How smart they get, the older we get. But you see, we don't appreciate that, I suppose, in our youth because, again, uh, people say, well, there's such an age gap, you know, generation gap, they call it between us and our parents. Folks, there's not much of a generation gap here. We, you know, we, we, are, we simply give you children advice because we have experienced some of those problems and we know what those problems are going to produce. And so don't be afraid to seek for good advice, to seek out the wisdom of others. This uh, isn't this a true of so many people, what Mark Twain said. The older we get, the more we realize the importance of good advice. Solomon has some good advice that we should accept. Proverbs 13 and 20. He who walks with wise men shall be wise, but the companions of fools shall be destroyed. Proverbs 19 and 20. Listen to the counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. We need to learn at an early age the importance of seeking for that advice. Take a good look at the people that are around you. Take a good look at the people that are influencing you. Take a good look at the people that you associate with and that you call your friends because our advice comes from them and our wisdom comes from them many times or our foolish actions sometimes may come from them. Are you impressed yet with how much the Bible says about wisdom? And yet I've never preached a sermon on it till today. Well, just when I developed this one. But, but it says so much. And so I think it's such a worthy, a worthy subject to consider. Another way that we learn to have wisdom is to learn humility. In Proverbs 11 and 12, when pride comes, then comes shame. But with the humble is wisdom. Humility will bring about wisdom. There was a story about a woman by the name of uh, Bianca Kapler. She was a German lady. She was a long jumper. That's one of those people you know who run down the track and they got this pole and you jump and, and you put the pole down and you, you go way up in the air. And uh, she was in that contest and she won the contest. She won the gold. She had jumped 20, I can't imagine this, but 22 feet, 10 inches. I mean, that's, that's way up there on this pole and she jumps and goes over the line. They said it was 22 feet, 10 inches. Well, she uh, uh, did something that was remarkable to which the newspapers called her the world's most honest athlete. When she was about to receive the gold medal, she said, I do not deserve this gold medal. I mean, the, all of the judges said that's what she jumped. She said, I didn't jump that. She said, I haven't been able to jump that ever in my life. And so they had to go back and look at all the tapes again and do all the measurements again. And sure enough, because she said, you know, the next one that was in under her was 21 feet, 11 and three quarters of an inch. And, and that's almost nine, 10 inches difference. And it just, that's just not possible. You know, you can get within a few inches, but it's not possible. So she wouldn't take the gold medal. And, 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 and so, you know, as I said, the newspapers call her the most honest of all the athletes because she was willing to refuse the gold medal because she knew within herself that she had not done this. Now that's humility. She could have just taken it and run with it and nobody would have known the wiser but she would have known. We have to admire Catherine, not just for her honesty, but for her understanding of what her abilities are. It's only when we admit that I need for God that wisdom will come to us. There are some other great lessons from Proverbs on wisdom. You can build a great foundation on wisdom. In fact, there's no other way to build a strong foundation for your spiritual house than on the wisdom that comes from above. Listen to this. Wisdom has built her house. Now, if we go to the book of Matthew, the seventh chapter, verses 24 through 29, we learn a little bit how to gain that wisdom. Jesus here referred to the house that was built upon a rock and the house that was built upon a sand. And the house that was built upon a rock were those individuals who had heard his word, 
and did it, heard his word and performed it in their lives. And, and, and he said, those who are built upon the rock, he said that when the floods come and when the rains fall, and when the winds blow, that house will stand. But if it's on the sand, he says, great will be the fall of it. So you can build a good foundation in your life simply by the obtaining of wisdom, which comes from the word of God, godly wisdom, uh, as, as gaining knowledge and then putting it into practice. It is the putting it into practice that is the exercise of wisdom. Wisdom is better than gold. He said this many times. How much better to get wisdom than gold? Proverbs 16, 16. There is a man by the name of Alexander Grigiola who immigrated to America from a foreign country. He came to America. He learned English, and then he earned three doctorate degrees. He was a very smart man. And he, do, he worked awful hard to be able to do that, to be able to even learn the English language and then to gain three doctorate degrees. He became a professor of the University of Pennsylvania. But he was miserable. He, he was just miserable. He just he didn't enjoy life. He just had, you know, he just had a gloomy, unlooking life. And look what he was able to gain. You'd think he'd be happy about that and, and say to people, you know, look what I've accomplished. But well, one day while getting a shoe shine, he marveled at the shoe shine boy who went about his humble job with joy. Shiny shoes, smiling, talking, and singing. You ever have your shoe shined? I, I've, I've been, you know, it, you don't hardly find them anymore. They used to be in barber shops. But uh, at the airport's about the only place you can find one now. And they're very few because everybody wears sneakers. <laughs> you can't shine a pair of sneakers. So I was talking to one of them the other day, and then, uh, he said, yeah, he said, our business is about none, he said, because nobody wears good shoes anymore. <laughs> so, but anyway, this, if you've ever been to one, that's what they do. They sit there, and they, they have a little tune, you know, that they sing as they're just a flipping that rag over your shoes and shining it and all of that. They're just as jolly. Everyone I've ever been to, they're just as jolly as can be, and this man here, Grigioli, he, he, he was getting his shoe shine, and he saw this young boy who had no doctorate degrees, had, you know, no nothing of, of any great things at all. In fact, you know, he just barely getting by shining shoes. And so he asked him the question, what makes you so happy? Why are you so happy? Why are you so jolly? And here was the reply of that shoe shine boy. His reply was, Jesus makes me happy. He loves me and died for me so God could forgive me of my badness. I like the way he put that. God can forgive me of my badness. He makes me happy. And so that wisdom is more valuable than three doctorate degrees. That wisdom that Jesus loves me. It's the greatest wisdom that you ever learn. It's greater than gold, wise man Solomon said. Well, you win the Darwin Award tonight if you don't develop wisdom. Surely you'll be smarter than Fabio. Surely you'll be smarter than Alfred and all the others, if you care to go and read of the accounts that are there, all the others that are recorded that have won that award. You, you win the award if you don't develop wisdom. Proverbs 30, verses 2 to 3. Surely I am more stupid than any man. I hope that none of us can say that. That's, that's not a statement that we want to apply to our lives. At least he was honest with what a terrible confession to make in this kind of your life. When you stand before God in judgment, you can't be afford to be without wisdom. And that is seen, I think, in Matthew, the 25th chapter, verses 32 through 36. In that account, we have a picture of the judgment day. We have an account of Jesus coming and separating the righteous from the unrighteous. We have an account of separating the sheep from the goats. And those on the right, he said, enter into the kingdom that has been prepared for you from the foundation of the world. I don't suppose that those individuals were educated people, a lot of them. They were just simple folks. But they were wise enough to know that whenever they saw somebody hungry, they fed them. When they saw somebody needing water, they gave them water. When they saw somebody sick, they visited them. And when they knew somebody was in prison, they went to see them. When they saw somebody that had a need of clothes or things that are of a you know, physical nature, they were there to provide those things for them. As I said, they may not have been college professors, but they were simple people with the wisdom 
to know that this is my job or this is what I need to do in order to please God. Those on the left, of course, they didn't hear those great words because of the fact that they were told to depart from him because they were workers of iniquity. This is a passage of scripture that I have quoted, and I, I know all of you teachers have quoted over and over again. It's one of the most famous passages of scripture in the Bible. It's, but, but I never knew its meaning. I'll tell you that right now. I never knew its meaning until I worked on this sermon. Oh, I thought I knew the meaning of it, but I didn't know it. Let me explain to you my understanding of this verse now. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's where wisdom comes in. You can study 24 hours a day, but if you don't rightly divide it, all that information and all that education doesn't mean a thing. You have to be able to appropriate it. You have to be able to rightly divide it, put it in its perspective. We all know that there's several divisions in the Word of God, the Old Testament, the New Testament. There, are, there, there is a rightly dividing, you know, to, as we talk about, you know, the statements and the commands of Jesus. Sometimes he was speaking to his own people, and sometimes it was to the world. But you have to understand that. So when you study the Word of God, rightly divide it and put it in its proper perspective and put it in its, its particular locality. And if it applies to you, live it. If it applied to somebody back in the Old Testament, leave it alone because that's just simply a fact of history. But this verse took on whole new meaning to me whenever I realized that wisdom comes because we rightly divide the word that we have studied. I hope tonight that we have shared with you something that will encourage you because remember in our series that we did this week on the church and the history of the church, one of the reasons that, uh, that the, the church began to fall away from the truth is because there was no knowledge and there was no knowledge, there's no wisdom. And so then people can take control of your life and they can put in your mind what they want to put in. You have no choice in the matter. But the reason the church began to come out of that situation was why? Because the Bible was once again printed and the Bible was once again handed out into the hands of the people. And so they came out of that darkness and we have come to where we are now. For some reason, it seems like we're going in the opposite direction once more with all the, the, the foolishness that, that, that's going on in our world. But we got to use our wisdom and determine what is right and what is wrong. And so study your scriptures to see what is right and what is wrong. We never know in the minds of those who are present here tonight. We want to extend an invitation one more time in this meeting. And if you'd like to obey the gospel, we plead with you to come to be baptized for the remission of your sins. Or if you're here and you've been a child of God and you've strayed away, gone back into the world, we beg of you to return. We would pray for you and with you that whatever you've done may be forgiven. Would you not come while we stand?